that's how we learn a yeah for example how we learn a uh, um you know a, a, a new language right uh we can uh read really examples we can learn the uh abstract grammars and we can make make mistakes and get feedbacks from our teacher and so on and so forth so this or uh by all this kind of information in different forms we can somehow like learn the language very quickly but how about uh you know machines right uh so far we don't have any like machine learning algorithm that can effectively use make use of all these kind of experiences at once to uh learn a skill or whatever uh to solve a to solve a problem uh so uh, in you know kdd last year we gave a um, tutorial about this general topic. Uh, how can we enable machine learning from uh, by making use of all different type of experiences? And uh, in today's talk, uh, in the first part, I will first uh, introduce the one of our latest works. Um, basically, uh, in 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 this thing, in this line of research, trying to use uh, reward functions to learn text energy models. So this is a work by uh, by students at CMU um, about text generation with efficient soft skill learning. Okay, so uh, we all know that reinforcement learning right, um, is a, a general framework that allows users to uh, plug in arbitrary reward functions to uh, to learn the model of interest. Right. So this is already a fertile research area for especially for like robotics and the uh, uh, video game control. But unfortunately, um, the success so far um, in training text generation is rather limited. Um, this is because of some you know, unique challenges in text generation, including the large sequence space, um, which depends on the vocabulary size and the, and the length of the text. Right? Like say, the vocabulary size usually uh, in an order of one million, right? and uh, say a text uh, text in sequence of dense twenty, you can see how large this uh, sequence space will be. And the second challenge is because of the sparse rewards. Say we use the blue score as the as the reward function, right? Um, usually we can evaluate the, the reward score only after we generate the whole text sequence, right? So uh, the reward is very sparse. A whole sequence corresponds to only a single scalar reward. This makes the learning very inefficient. As a result, um, with the current reinforcement learning formulation for text generation, um, it's usually impossible to train a text generation model from scratch. So we usually have to like initialize the model with uh, some supervised learning um, algorithms like maximum likelihood estimation. And uh, the improvement over supervised learning is uh, pretty unclear. Um, so um, we usually in practice, we should do not use um, reinforcement learning uh, for text generation. So next, let's uh, go into a, bit, a little bit more details of the current formulation of RL for text generation to get a better sense of the limitations and to motivate our new um, frameworks. So um, we usually are trying a, want to train a text generation model, right? which is usually an autoregressive model. Given a given a sentence, right? To generate a sentence Y um, of a sequence of tokens, um, the autoregressive model is like this. Um, basically, uh, defines the property of a token given all the previous tokens by um, by applying a softmax function on top of the logit right, as the model output. So uh, with this setting. Um, if we see this from the uh, reinforcement learning perspective, uh, the sequence, the sentence is also called the trajectory and the, the, the token to be generated is called the action, right? Also, we usually denote this as an, as an A. And the previous tokens um, as the condition of generating this token is also called the state, denoted as S. And the whole generation model is called, also called the policy, okay? And uh, um, so uh, to generate, after generating a token A, given a state S, we will receive a reward right, uh, from, the, from the environment, like say the, the, the blue score. 
But as, as, as I mentioned, uh, the reward signal is usually very sparse in tax generation. Uh, for all uh, intermediate steps, the rewards are usually just zero. And uh, you receive a, a sequence of rewards that is non-zero only um, at the final step. Uh, the general reinforcement learning objective is to maximize the cumulative rewards, basically by ag aggregating the rewards uh, along the, uh, the whole sequence. Right? Here, gamma is a, is a discount vector, uh, which is equal to, or like less than, less than one. And uh, a, a general a essential concept in reverse planning is the Q function, which measures the expected future rewards of taking um, action A in state S. Um, here we can see like we start with um, this step T and uh, aggregate all the rewards in the future, um, which uh, defines the Q function. So with this basic setup, uh, let's see uh, the current formulations of reinforcement learning. Right? Um, the most popular RL of a tax generation is the so-called own policy RL, uh, like they say uh, policy gradients. Right? Um, uh, it updates the, the, the policy or the generation model with this objective. Um, I want to go into more details here, but uh, the, the key thing here is the, um, the expectation, um, which is taken over the current policy itself, right? which means that like, we generate the tax samples using the current policy pi theta itself. Right? And then we use these samples to evaluate the, the policy gradient and update the policy itself, um, just like this figure shows. Um, so the, 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 the issue of this, uh, this formulation is that um, the data efficiency is extremely low because uh, most of the samples from the current policy are just like a, a gibberish. Uh, with zero reward. So uh, here, this, this, this reward signal is always zero, which means the samples cannot contribute to learning. Right? So uh, most of the samples from the model does not, do not contribute to the learning, making the data efficiency very, very low. Um, so the second broad category of the RL over text generation is so-called the uh, off-policy RL. Like say the familiar Q learning, right? Uh, we all know that this is the, the underlying algorithm for a lot of like uh, applications like AlphaGo and other um, successful robotics control. Um, so Q learning implicitly learn the policy by approximating the Q function. Um, this is based on the so-called temporal Bellman temporal con consistency, which says that um, an optimal Q Q function must satisfy this um, equation. Basically, the relation between the Q values at step T and the Q values of the next step. And with this uh, temporal consistency, we define the learning objective uh, of Q theta, of, of the Q function. The intuition is that we want to train a Q function such that it satisfies this temporal consistency. Right, so that it can be the optimal Q value, Q function. Um, the, the objective is pretty straightforward. Um, this is the regression target derived from the Bellman equation. Right? Um, and we train the Q function to approximate this regression target. And here, uh, theta, theta hat is the target Q network, which is derived from the Q function, um, but it's uh, held fixed during training. So uh, this is called off-policy reinforcement learning because uh, here the expectation is taken learning. over. Uh, sorry, is there a question? Uh, I don't think so. I think yeah. Just... yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a question okay. from the audience or? Uh -huh. I think it's just the noise from one okay. audience. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. And maybe uh, we uh, can yeah. just Use them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, start. Okay. Uh, please, please go ahead. Cool. Yeah. So this algorithm is um uh, is off policy because yeah. the expectation yeah. is taken um under whatever policy uh, we want to use. Like say this policy or it, which is essentially a distribution of the text sequences. Right. Um, this can be the training data. Uh, like what we show uh, in this figure. 
So um, yeah, this is the uh, the overall architecture of the of of policy reinforcement learning. So after we learn the um, the Q function, we can induce the policy or the text generation model. Um, say for example, we just take the every time we just take the generate the token which receive the highest uh, Q value. So uh, this formulation again uh, has some limitations. The first limitation is that um, the optimization can be very unstable because the regression target is unstable. We can see that uh, this part, right, this is a targeted Q network, which is derived from the Q network itself. Right? So uh, this is kind of a, a bootstrapping, which we, we know that uh, bootstrapping is very unstable. And the second part, this reward, as we say in text generation, this reward is very sparse, right? For all T uh, smaller than the, the final capital T, uh, the reward is just a zero. So this, this means that in this target, in this regression target, we don't have any uh, true training signals uh, included here and, the, uh, and, and the, uh, to be used to train the, the target, uh, the, the Q function of interest. Right? So the training is very unstable. And the second uh, issue is the, the update is very slow. From this loss, we can see that we uh, the gradient will only involve the Q value of a particular action or particular token AT uh, included in, 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 the, uh, in the samples. And we know that the, we have a very large forgabber size, like 1 million tokens in the forgabber. Every time, by just updating one particular updating the Q value of one particular token, right? This optimization is very very slow. So uh, this is the, the the fundamental limitations of the standard Q learning. So um, as a quick summary, right? Um, the current RL formulation for text generation suffers from uh, these different difficulties that prevents the RL algorithm to be effective and to like say train the language model from scratch. Okay, so let's motivate us. Uh, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, I, I missed, the, I probably missed in the beginning, like what is the reward? It was not clear to me. So a reward, like say uh, in machine translation, we can use a, a blue score right, um, as a reward. Like say you, you, you generate the whole translated sentence and use the blue score to evaluate the uh, the, uh, oh, the quality okay. of the translation. Uh, so you only evaluate at the end of the translation. So it's not a token by token reward. Yeah, so in text generation, we usually don't have token by token reward, but we usually okay. just have the uh, reward at a sequence level. Okay. So let's, let's pose a, a unique challenge here. Thanks. Yeah, I also you, have a follow up for this. So, so some, sometimes right. when you optimize uh, like, uh, a blue, a blue score for, for, as a reward. Uh, often, uh, I, I found that sometimes you will get a better a blue, a blue score, but the actual text quality uh, will not increase. The, uh, what, what do you think about this? I mean, uh, yeah, I think I will, I will come to this part uh, in our experiments. Like say, usually, uh, so the flexibility of our RL right, enables us to like plug in whatever reward you want, like say, uh, besides blue score, you can also plug in what other reward, like say language perplexity as a as one of the reward to encourage the fluency of the generation. So in our experiments, I will show some examples. Okay, so uh, yeah, so here comes to our uh, new uh, reinforcement RL formulation, uh, which is based on the so-called uh, soft Q learning. Uh, so perhaps it's best to uh, best introduced uh, by a kind of a side side by side comparison with the uh, uh, standard hard Q learning and the, the soft Q learning. Um, so we have seen the overall goal of reinforcement learning or like Q learning, right? Um, is to maximize the cumulative reward. But in in soft Q learning, uh, we have we kind of regularize the objective with an entropy turn. We want, to, we want the model to be as uncertain as possible. So with this, this single um, very simple modification of the objective 
immediately leads to some very nice properties of the soft Q learning. First is about the, the inducer policy. So in hard Q learning, we say, okay, every time uh, after we change the Q, Q function, like we induce the policy by just taking the greedy token uh, F time step. But in, in, in this uh, soft Q learning, uh, the best policy is by applying the soft max function on top of the Q values. So uh, this reminds us uh, about the, the, the soft max and the logit function uh, and the logit right, in, in standard, uh, stand, standard text generation model. Right. So basically we can implement this, uh, the whole architecture with the common generation model architecture, basically. Um, so now the, the logit, the, the model output is no longer interpreted as logit, but now being, uh, you know, Q values um, of the soft Q learning. And the, after we change this model, we, we get the policy by applying the soft max function on top of Q values. Right. So this makes the soft Q learning implementation very easy. Um, yeah, and the, so in terms of the training of the, of the Q functions, uh, we say that in hard Q learning, we uh, derive the objective based on the temporal consistency which uh, leads to like unstable training and a slow update. And this soft Q learning kind of enables some like a additional nice properties, uh, which we call uh, past consistency. Uh, that leads to some objectives that are uh, stable and efficient. So uh, let me go into a little bit more details about this, about this training. Um, so the past consistency, uh, the single step version, is written uh, in this way. Here we introduce some intermediate notations, like the, the value function uh, v is defined as a, as a function of the q as the q function basically, and uh, the the inducer policy like this. So with this pass consistency again, we can derive some regression objective, just like what we did for uh, hard Q learning. Right? Um, here, this is the regression target. But we want to optimize the, the Q function uh, instantiated as the uh, inducer policy here. But we want to optimize this until it satisfies this past consistency. Right? So this is the regression target. Um, so for people who are familiar with reinforcement learning, uh, this regression target can be approximately seen as the advantage function, uh, which means that soft Q learning is trying to match this log probability of token A um, with the advantage value. This is different from maximum likelihood training where uh, the algorithm is trying to, always trying to like increase the log probability of token AT, right? If the AT is observed in the data. Um, so uh, this, this objective has some nice properties. Um, here we can see the updates will be much faster than the hard Q learning because because this gradient involves the Q values of all tokens in the vocabulary, right? Because of the soft max function, right? This, uh, this part involves all Q values um, of all tokens in the vocabulary. And uh, uh, this past consistency further has a multi-step multi -step version, uh, which is basically by aggregating the left-hand side and the right-hand side across the time steps. So we get this multi-step version of past consistency. And based on this, uh, we can further derive a second e objective. Um, again, is a regression. Um, this part is the regression target um, based on the past consistency. And uh, um, we can see um, some nice things here. Um, we are including this final step reward right, as the part of the regression target, right? um, let's say the blue score of the whole generation. So uh, yeah, which means the regression target now includes some true training signals from the external uh, environment. So this makes the updates much more stable than the standard Q learning. So Sorry, uh, uh, can I ask a question again? Yeah. I, I didn't quite understand what you mean by path consistency. So like looking at the equation there at the top, like you saying that the, 
the reward the value equals the reward minus the log yeah so this past consistency uh was derived in some previous paper uh in, in the robotics domain so the path means actually means uh this part actually so you can see uh there's a there is a path or like a sub trajectory from like step t a uh, small t to capital capital t and this path consistently basically says that what uh for whatever sub trajectory uh between these two time steps uh this equation must hold if the um uh, the value function is optimal basically so um uh, that's why we call it path consistency yeah but uh, yeah this, this this part is based on you know the previous research or previous advances in reinforcement learning so um yeah we are kind of like uh, introducing this uh concept into text generation and the based on this we derive um training objectives okay okay so um yeah, so uh, the final thing we want to note is that um, here the expectation again, uh, like in standard Q learning, right? Uh, this is this can be upstream policy. So you can just plug in whatever you like um, to for estimating the objectives. Like say by plugging the training data, uh, if if we have a, a access to training data, right? Then this leads to off policy update. We can of course plug in the current policy. Uh, to get on policy updates. So in practice, we can just combine both to get the best of two. Um, yeah, so the, the math equations here are, seems a little bit, you know, uh, evolve, involved, right? So, uh, but the implementation is actually pretty straightforward. Um, we can use whatever uh, autoregressive language model we want. Uh, and then get the samples, right? Either off policy samples uh, by sampling from data or on policy samples by sampling, by decoding with the current model. And then we evaluate the Q values by just like uh, doing the, the very common like a uh, forward path, right? To get the logic. And then we evaluate the rewards with some like say whatever reward function you have, like blue score or whatever other function we'll see later. And then evaluate the objective. Uh, with some like very simple code. Basically, it's a, a regression problem with the uh, regression loss. Okay, so with this uh, framework, we show some applications. Um, the first is about uh, learning from noisy and the neg negative text. Um, so we, we do study on the entailment generation. Uh, given a premise, we want to generate a hypothesis that the entails the premise. Um, but the data here we construct uh, is very noisy or even include negative samples. Like say uh, the average prop in term property is only 50% and uh, around the, uh, half of the samples have a very slow and internal property uh, which can be seen as a negative samples. Um, so to train the internal generation model, we plug in a couple of reward functions like an entailment classifier to make the generation accurate, right? To generate intel entailment. And we use, we plug in a pre-trained language model to evaluate the perplexity um, as the second reward to encourage the generation to be fluent. And we also plug a blue score with the improved premise, which uh, in our study, which we, we, we found that this is very helpful to prevent the trivial generations. So here, here's some results. Um, so we generate, uh, we evaluate entailment rates and the language perplexity against the diversity. Basically, uh, there is a trade-off between the performance and the diversity of the generation. Uh, we can see, um, so basically MLE and uh, some pure off-policy reinforcement learning does not work because, uh, you know, they rely have very heavily on the data quality, but with the noisy and the negative data, uh, you cannot get a good generator. And the um, uh, SQL, our, our framework, with uh, basically performs the best and is is better than the uh, MLE plus policy gradients. Right? Policy gradient alone does not work; it's, it cannot be trained from scratch. So you have to combine both. Um, but it's still uh, not as good as um, soft queue learning. Um, and the single step soft queue learning seems not 
are not working in this case. Um, we show that multi-step SQL is, is crucial to include the two, basically solve the sparse reward problem in case generation. Um, yeah, the second uh, application about uh, adversarial attacks to uh, entailment classifier. Um, so we try to generate the readable hypothesis that are classified as entailment for all input premises. And we try to attack the most popular uh, entailment classifier on hugging face. Uh, the training data, so usually we don't have any direct supervision data. Uh, we can just some weak data, which is just the hypothesis in uh, uh, entailment classification data sets. And again, we incorporate a couple of rewards uh, as we did uh, in the last uh, study. So uh, yeah, this is some pre previous adversarial algorithms are not applicable here because uh, they either cannot attack, they can only attack for a specific premise instead of this universal attack for all premises. And uh, uh, for like the generation is not readable. Um, so we compare with MLE plus policy gradient. Um, so the results showing that um, MLE plus policy gradient is trying is uh, basically tend to collapse. It cannot generate more diverse text um, after collapse. So um, SQL again is much better. And uh, we show like the two algorithms uh, somehow find some patterns that can attack the, the classifier. Like say with this premise, uh, with this hypothesis, uh, the classifier will classify um, it as entailments on like almost all like uh, input premises. So I, uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, so I have a question. Uh, if you have uh, multiple rewards, so how do you combine these rewards to, uh, to have a loss function? So I have a question for this point. Yeah, so basically you just like say after you generate a whole sample, right, by the, by the generation model of whatever of policy sample, it just evaluates all these rewards for this sample and uh, do an average, like to get an average reward. So uh, it means uh, the rewards are with you somehow, right? Yeah, yeah, okay, it's a so weighted sum of all this. Yeah, and the way here we just, yeah, do a, a kind of like, a, all the weights are just one. So we don't tune the uh, weights for each of the reward functions. Okay, it seems like a multiple task in the right? Uh, yeah, you can see it as a multiple task or like say, it's just a multiple object, right? Objective, right? So we want the generation to be fluent. So we just plug in the pre language model. To, to encourage fluency, but we want the uh, generation to be accurate, then we plug in the classifier as a reward, right? So this is the flexibility of RL, right? Say whatever we want, whatever property we want to get um, in the output, then we plug in the uh, appropriate reward function into the framework so that you can get that property. Okay, got it, thank you. Okay, so uh, the third application about uh, prompt generation, um, we want to generate the prompt. We want to train the prompt generator such that it can generate a prompt given a topic. And uh, after we input this prompt to a pre-trained language model, like say GPT-2 or GPT-3, the language model will generate something uh, of this uh, specified topic. Right. So here we can see uh, the pipeline Slack face, the whole thing can be seen as a reward function, right? To train the prompt generator, right? And we can see the whole pipeline is discrete, right? This part is discrete because of the discrete tokens. This part is discrete. So this prevents uh, the current so called uh, prompt tuning methods that are based on gradient back propagation uh, uh, to apply here, right? Because uh, they, they require gradient back propagation, but the uh, this part are all discrete. So reinforcement learning has this advantage that um, you can uh, handle these discrete components in a pipeline. Okay, so we, we train uh, this model and compare with quite a couple of baselines. Like say the, uh, this 
the reason the stairs decoding everything like plug plug and play uh, language model or like a uh, Jedi. Um, and the, we also compare with the MLE plus PG. So we can see like across all these algorithms, uh, SQL kind of achieved the best trade-off between accuracy and the language fluency. Um, and this prompt, con prompt control uh, by reinforced learning is kind of much better than the state of decoding, the specialized algorithm for controllable generation of pre-trained language models. And it is much faster because uh, this specialized decoding requires some like a very complex uh, computation during the inference time. But uh, for reinforcement learning, right, with prompts, you just input the prompt and do the, the common um, decoding. Like, so it's very fast. And uh, if we compare this to like uh, the soft queue learning with only off policy training with training data uh, and compare this with the maximum likelihood estimation, we can see this off, off policy training is better than um, the supervised training. Okay, so uh, the last part is about uh, some results on standard supervised task. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we show that SQL from scratch is kind of competitive with supervised learning like MLE. Um, even on standard tasks where we have access to clean data. Um, so we get a bad, uh, kind of compar comparable results and the PG from scratch does not work. Um, and we show that SQL is much more robust than MLE plus PG. If we try different hyper hyperparameters, um, we can see that like, uh, these curves are much more stable. I, uh, uh, I, I so uh, can I ask a small question? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so the MLE plus PG do you, uh, so do you mean first training the model with MLE and then optimize it with PG or you do it uh, to these two targets together? I mean, are there so we, we first uh, uh, train with MLE and then we combine the two objectives, MLE and the PG objectives. Okay, uh, so this is, mm -hmm. yeah, so, so if you like, uh, uh, like change the order of training, does it have any difference? Uh, yeah, so basically it, it won't work. You, you have to first initialize with MLE and then um, add the PG objective to do fine tuning. So this is the only way policy gradient can work. Um, but of course the improvement is pretty limited compared to just you know, MLE training. Okay, I see, I see, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so this is the, uh, the, the, the first work I want to present today. Um, I'm a quick sorry, summary. Uh, I, I have a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, did you evaluate the training time for your previous slides? I mean the training. Uh, training time is pretty much comparable with MLE, like you can see the training curve. So yeah, it converges roughly uh, with the same time cost. Basically. Okay, uh, so yeah. So it seems that, uh, yeah, for the next slides, it seems that uh, your model is more stable than, than the MLE plus the PG, right? Uh, so I heard that many people say that reinforced learning is not stable in, in very hard training. So, yeah, so it seems yeah, that- Yeah, so you can see, right, um, here, uh, this MLE plus PG, right, it kind of like collapse uh very often right um so we only with proper hyperparameters you can get like a moderate result right? so this is sensitivity hyperparameters and the sql seems to be more robust and uh, uh yeah and you can see even with mle plus pg right uh it's still like a comparable with just mle so this is mle plus pg is very you know uh we don't really use this very often because you, you don't really see a lot of improvements and the training is very difficult. So um, this is the, the, the drawbacks of this algorithm. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, so um, this is the first part. Um, with SQL, you get better, uh, more stable training and the faster updates than the previous um, 
uh, reinforcement learning formulations when you don't have any like a supervised data for like a supervised learning. Okay, so um, next I'm going to very quickly go through the second part, um, trying to address the bias data problem um, for text generation. So here uh, we are trying to formulate a causal perspective for controllable text generation. So we know controllable text generation, right? Uh, we want to basically control a different aspect of a text, like say an attributes or some structure, uh, say in, in a dialogue system. And the two fundamental tasks of controllable generation involves like say a, a attribute of conditional generation, like given an attribute, we want to generate the sentence of this particular attribute, or like a text attribute transfer, or sometimes we call it the text style transfer. Basically, to rewrite an existing sentence to get a different attribute. Right. So this has a lot of applications in, like, say, building emotional chatbots, generating adversarial attacks, or what uh, just do like data augmentation. Um, so common method for controllable text generation. Previously, people used different separate solutions for the two tasks, respectively. Usually, attribute conditional is modeled as the conditional dispute. Conditional model, right? Very naturally, like given x, uh, given a to generate x, and the attribute text attribute transfer is like this. So uh, these are usually just machine learning based models, which learns the correlations in the data. Uh, if we see this from the perspective of causal inference, uh, this is at the first level of causal inference, which is basically based on the association or correlation of the data. Uh, based on some like a joint, marginal or conditional distributions. Right? Um, so this inherits the data from, inherits the bias from the data. So in this work, um, we, we adopt this causal perspective and propose a new kind of like a unified framework for the two tasks. Um, we want to model the causal relationships instead of the spurious correlations of the attribute and the and the, and the text. And we want to generate unbiased text using uh, rich causality tools. So this corresponds to the causal ladder. Um, um, for attributed conditional generation, we propose that uh, this task is better uh, modeled by this uh, intervention instead of uh, association. Basically, by using this the, the, the tool called do operation, which remove the dependency between the attributes and other confounders. And for text attributed transfer, it naturally corresponds to the counterfactual uh, in, in, in causality, which basically trying to, trying to answer this question, like what would the text be if the attribute had taken a different value? So um, yeah, let me uh, go into a little bit details about this framework. Uh, at the basis of the causal, causal framework for text generation, is the so-called structural causal model. Uh, here we propose this model. Um, the outcome is text because we want to generate the text. Right? Um, say we want to generate the restaurant review. Um, A is the, uh, the treatment, which is the, the attribute of interest, like say sentiment. And we, we additionally uh, model all these different confounders that uh, introduce the correlation, spurious correlations or biases in, in the generation. So this uh, confounder is basically whatever uh, factors that correlate, correlate with both the treatment and outcome. And the confounder is usually, uh, it's basically impossible for us to measure or to have all uh, confounder labels. So this confounder is modeled as a latent variable. Uh, for example, the confounder can be how popular the restaurant is and uh, what's the customer's personal preference of the food, right? So these kind of things we cannot measure directly or we don't have access to these kind of labels. So uh, this is the latent variable. But we do observe some information about the confounders. Like say, uh, we, we may know the, the full type of the restaurant. So this is all modeled with the proxy variable C. So this is the, uh, the, the the structural causal model for controllable text generation. And the next we I will show like how this simple causal model can support a lot of different you know, inference 
to do these different tasks in control row generation. Um, uh, yeah, so this model, this graph basically defines this trend distribution um, with this decomposition. And uh, for people who are familiar with version of the encoder or version inference, we'll introduce a inference network or version distribution to uh, approximate, to estimate this uh, latent variable Z given the observations. So the first type of inference um, using intervention to do contribute conditional generation. So we know, as I mentioned, right, uh, previously people just do this uh, conditional distribution, which corresponds to this decomposition if we introduce the latent variable. Um, but if we do intervention with the do operation, um, which basically sets A um, to a given value independently of Z, which are uh, effectively you remove the dependency between the two variables in the, in the causal graph. This corresponds, this distribution corresponds to this decomposition. We can see the key difference um, between these two, right? Um, this is a conditional uh, Z given A, which basically inherits the biases in the data or correlations between the commander and the, the, the attribute. So um, with this two operation, we get unbiased um, conditional generation, basically. And the second is the second tool is the counterfactual for text attribute transfer. Um, as I said, it answers this question, like what, what the text will be if the attribute has taken a different value. So um, again, in causality, there is a readily available uh, standard procedure to do causal inference, uh, to do the counterfactual inference. We first, given a X, we first get the, the latent commander by doing the abduction, and then uh, we do the intervention to set the attribute value and then do the prediction to get the new piece of text um, based on the structure causal model. And the third type of inference, um, this, uh, we use the propensities you waiting for the biasing uh, pre-trained language model. Like say in this setting, let's say we already have a existing language model, which is biased because of the traditional machine learning based modeling but how can we convert it to an unbiased distribution right? without retraining the language model uh, from scratch? So we, if we take a look at this uh, interventional conditional uh, conditional distribution uh, with this decomposition we, are, we have already seen, uh, we can do some simple manipulation and get this. And here, uh, P A given Z is called the propensity score which measures the probability of Z like being assigned to the treatment A. Um, so this is the kind of a weight um, we can use to like a reweight the distribution. Um, basically we can implement this distribution with this uh, given the components, right? Here are uh, the pre-trained language model uh, is plugged here and we have other learned components. Then all these learned components can be seen as a reweighting to the um, pre-trained language model. And uh, this implementation is pretty straightforward. Um, we use sampling, importance resampling. Uh, we first get the biased samples using just the pre-trained language model and the compute the weight, uh, the sample weight, and then do resampling uh, proportional to the weight. And uh, this, uh, the new set of samples will be unbiased um, given this uh, uh, distribution basically. So uh, yeah, about the learning of the structure causal model, uh, I want to uh, give more details here because of time constraints, but uh, uh, the overall idea is basically we want to evaluate the model parameters and the versional distribution parameters. And we use the versional encoder objective. And more crucially, we need to incorporate other counterfactual objectives based on the counterfactual inference so that the model can learn these entangled representations and uh, um, effective control. So, uh, but uh, yeah, I don't have time to uh, give the details. So about the uh, experiments, um, we evaluate on, we conduct experiments on two data sets. One is Yelp, uh, one another is, the other is the online biographies. So the data sets, we, we would construct the, data, construct the data set to be very challenging. Um, say we want to control the sentiments 
And the confounding factor is the category, like say whether it's the restaurant review or review of other entities. Um, we make the data set to be, uh, so it has a lot of like spurious correlations, like 90% of the data have the same in sentiment or category labels. Like say if 90% uh, of the positive sentiments data is about the restaurants and 90% of uh, non-restaurants review is negative sentiment. So this is a very challenging data. And similarly for this online biography, um, yeah, the correlation is even higher, like 95%. And uh, all the components are initialized with the GPT-2. So we do this uh, attribute the conditional generation. Um, we compare the, the causal model with the traditional machine learning based conditional language models. Um, uh, like say the models in this way. So we can see um, basically this, eval we evaluate the control accuracy, like how accurate the, 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 the sentiments is entailed in the generation. And the bias, like say how correlated are the sentiments and the category. Uh, we can see this, uh, the causal model improves the accuracy and it significantly reduce the bias like from like a 90% to like a 60%. Um, so the same for on the bio data, data sets. Um, and uh, for human evaluation, the same conclusion. And uh, we can see some uh, generations, right? Um, this conditional model usually uh, generated restaurant, uh, restaurant reviews, which are always like a uh, sentiment positive. Uh, yeah, positive sentiments. And for our model, uh, we kind of like be able, to, we are able to like generate kind of like a, in an unbiased way. Okay, for text style transfer. Um, so yeah, we do, we, sh we show that a game, our, our model is kind of like a less biased and uh, with high ac control accuracy. And the previous ML based models basically failed on most of the samples. It cannot accurately transfer the, the, the sentiment. And even on unbiased data, we kind of like get a better performance compared to previous method. So to de-bias the pre-trained model, uh, like say here on, we use the pre-trained model to generate the 10,000 samples and do resampling to get 2,000 samples uh, with the propensity score. Again, we get a much lower bias. So yeah, this is the second work uh, with causal inference for text generation. Um, yeah, so basically, um, yeah, we kind of like combine the causality with machine learning for a unified unbiased controllable generation with different tools like a intervention, counterfactual, and the propensity weighting. And uh, uh, it will be very interesting to see like how this causal modeling can be generalized or applied to other text generation problems, like say dialogue summarization to try to uh, model other uh, more complex causal relationships to given the concept. Okay, yeah, so it's pretty much I want to present today, uh, including a reinforced learning framework and the causal framework. Yeah, I'm happy to take more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Zilin, for his uh, wonderful talk. So, any questions from the audience? Hi, Zilin, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, for your first, uh, first work in the causal framework, you, you mentioned that there is a confounder Z, right? Is there uh, in your experiments, it seems that the Z is manually uh, identified. Is there any way to uh, automatically identify such con 